let's get started. Again, just a quick introduction for those of you on the line who may not have spent a lot of time researching product cost management and are just trying to really understand what kinds of challenges does it address. We look at product cost management as is really kind of an enterprise-wide, value chain-wide type of challenge for big companies who really, every time they touch and make any kind of decision, they're going to have an impact on product cost and ultimately the profitability of the pro program that they're running. So you can see here that we have different roles and responsibilities that touch the product as it evolves from an early concept all the way through to launch, ramp, production, and in the market. So one of the folks that we see most commonly involved in this and has uh, a really tough job are the senior cost engineer or any cost engineer. They're typically a relatively small team in any major manufacturer and this, this creates a situation where they have insufficient resources and technology to cost optimize all new product designs. They focus on what they believe are the most expensive products and that leaves a lot of products that are not cost optimized as they move through the product development life cycle. Of course you have the folks who are designing the products, the designers and the engineers and most of the companies that we visit have very little visibility to the impact of the design trade-off decisions they make every day. They really don't have any tools to track the current cost as they're making different decisions about the design, the materials. These are things that have a really significant impact on the ultimate cost to manufacture and the cost to sell a product. Of course, most companies these days have very extensive value chains and they work with a variety of suppliers who are scattered across the globe. So the folks in sourcing and supply chain also have a really tough job. They're trying to negotiate the best price and have a collaborative partnership with their suppliers. But again, in their case, they have limited visibility to should cost or manufacturing data for fact-based negotiations with suppliers. A lot of times they rely on information that may be in their ERP system from a past purchase. But because of the dynamic nature of markets and the change in cost of materials and labor and logistics, Using historical data is very challenging when you're looking at new products that are coming to market. Other folks that are involved in the process and also have impact on product cost and profitability are folks like the manufacturing engineers, product line managers, and business executives who really have very limited visibility to the profitability status of really important NPI programs that may really help them drive more revenue in the market and greater market share. So everybody in the product development process in, in a global manufacturer is touching costs, making decisions that impact costs, and across the board have very little visibility to the impact that their trade-off decisions are making. So that's kind of where a priori comes in. So a priori has a product cost management software technology that allows everybody on the team to see the right information at the right time. And so as you can imagine, the types of information that a manufacturing engineer or design engineer need are very different from what a supply chain buyer or product line manager is looking for. And so a priori has a, a database technology that allows everybody to work from the same set of information and present that information in a format that's meaningful for them. And so we'll just very quickly review some of the highlights of how we generate a, a product cost estimate and generate the manufacturing data that is very valuable when you're looking at how to optimize designs and optimize sourcing strategies. So kind of at the highest level, uh, a priori provides a flexible costing uh, model and one of the key hallmarks of our product is the ability to do automated costing using a 3D CAD model for parts and assemblies. We also offer table-driven costing for products that are typically not designed in CAD. So things that you might think about here are wire harnesses or soon to be a printed circuit board assembly uh, is another uh, process module that a priori will be offering in the very near future. And finally, we have uh, user-guided costing, which is just another way to uh, define the inputs for a particular product design in the manufacturing process that will be used to 
uh, produce that product. The second key factor that a priori offers in its technology platform is the ability to understand the manufacturing environment. So as I mentioned before, most companies have a distributed manufacturing model where they have their own factories and suppliers located all around the world. So to generate a detailed cost, after you extract geometric cost drivers from a CAD model, let's say, then you have to understand, well, where is that going to be manufactured? Is it in your own particular factory? Is it in a supplier factory? Or are you just trying to get a cost for a particular region? A priori supports that through the concept of virtual pro uh, production environments. And you'll see today when Karen's talking how Tetra Pak has been able to leverage that concept to be able to do things like sh better should cost negotiation. <clears throat> Lastly, as I mentioned, many of the technology platforms that have historically been available, especially to cost engineers, are based on a desktop type of architecture, whereas a priori offers a centralized database that allows costs to evolve over time as different inputs are discovered and identified when a product matures. We also offer the opportunity to integrate with other key enterprise applications like product lifecycle management and ERP are some of the most commonly used systems that we need to either extract information from, uh, for example, perhaps reading in a bill of materials or exporting information after a cost has been generated and put putting that information into your PLM system or ERP, for example. So uh, there are a wide variety of companies and in industry verticals that have adopted product cost management strategies. And you see some of them here. And again, they're very much attracted to the concept of being able to very quickly generate a cost estimate and detailed manufacturing data about how that product is most efficiently manufactured. And you can see companies in uh, industry verticals like Consumer Durables, Whirlpool, or in aerospace and defense, Boeing and Honeywell. You've got companies in Europe such as Alstom, which is a, a really large global manufacturer of rail cars. You've got automotive suppliers like American Axle and Manufacturing. But the company we're really here to talk about today is uh, our friends at Tetra Pak. And so what we'll do now is we'll very quickly kind of transition into our presentation about how Tetra Pak is using product cost management. But before we switch over, just one last uh, comment for you folks who are continuing to learn more and want to learn more about product cost management strategies, both in this webinar and beyond. A priori offers a, a major program every year that draws in some of the best practitioners of product cost management across the globe in all kinds of different industries. Our Cost Insight Conference this year is going to be held in Orlando, Florida from February 6th to the 8th. So I highly encourage you to think about maybe if you're really interested in adopting this kind of strategy after you hear how well Tetra Pak's doing, this might be something you might want to think about to continue your education and your learning on this topic. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Karen and let her deliver her portion of the presentation. Okay, Karen, you're up. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Rick, and thank you, everyone, for joining and listening to uh, Tetra Pak's journey to change. Uh, just a short presentation of myself. Um, I've been 15 years with Tetra Pak. Uh, I have a long background within supplier management and supply chain, as well as engineering, and I see design for cost combination of, of uh, those two experiences. So let me start with um, just a background of Tetra Pak and the Tetra Pak Group. We are working with food and food safety, and the Tetra Pak Group is consisting of, of three companies, Tetra Pak, De Laval, and Sidel. Those companies together have a very long history. We started already 1878, so really a long history, with the, the first milk separator developed by, by Mr. De Laval. And then in 1952, the first packaging machine for milk was delivered in, in Lund, in Sweden, and in 1961, the, the first blow molding machines for plastic bottles was delivered. The company is focuses on technologies for efficient production and packaging of distribution of, of food. It's a Swedish origin, but headquartered in Switzerland as it is today. And like another big Swedish company, IKEA, it's totally privately owned. 
a little bit of background of, of Tetra Pak and some facts and figures to have a base for you to understand what we're doing. We are present in more than 170 countries and we have operations in all continents. Eight, 80 sales offices around the world, 32 market companies, 6 R&D units, 11 technical training centers, and 48 manufacturing sites. We specialize in providing customers with complete solutions for the processing, packaging, and distribution of food products. And uh, our mission statement is we commit to making food safe and available everywhere. Looking at our history, since we are providing packages or packaging of mostly liquid products, uh, we have measured our success in the number of sold packages. And as you can see, it's a steadily growing volume of packages that we sell. And last year we sold 184 billion packages around the world. Those packages come in a big range of sizes, and, and I, I believe you uh, recognize some of those. The one that the company started with is this one, this Tetraedon, which also gave the company its name. The product that we pack in, in our packages is mostly liquid, and dairy product is by far the biggest one, but other, other areas growing as well. We have a huge install base. Processing unit is almost 75,000. Packaging machines, almost 9,000, and 20,000 distribution machines. They take, take care of, of the package when it's wanted to build. Those are uh, in endless, almost endless number of variants, and the newest machines can produce up to 40,000 packages per hour. The delivery last year was 2,000 processing units, 400 packaging machines, and 1,000 distribution machines. The install base is steadily growing by the yearly sales, and not too many machines are taken out of operation. So a quick summary. We are soon to be 24,000 employees. The net sales is 12 billion euros. We are present with our packages in more than 170 countries. We have packaging material and closure plants of 37 uh, and filling machine assembly plants 5, R&D unit 6, and technical training centers 11. Let's go into the area of research, research and development. This is the part where we actually do have the use for a priori. Just a quick glance of the organization. It's of course a big market organization. We have divided the, the world into five different clusters, and within the development and service operations, we do have our R&D. It's a big organization, and we are present in multiple locations and working with a lot of different cultures. It's, of course, a big challenge to make sure that we work in the same way, to have uh, the same goals and work in the same direction. So how do we take care of that? We have a central organization that is called Engineering Capability Office short echo, not, not to mix with ecologic. It's a central organization with four major areas, project and competence management, engineering information management, engineering excellence, and product creation process excellence. The engineering capabilities office mission is to create a product, productive environment throughout the product life cycle, where engineers can be engineers and the right product information is available when needed. So how do we do, do that? Our aim is to provide methods and tools, processes and knowledge to make sure that the engineers actually can be engineers and focus on what they actually should do. So back to uh, Engineering Capability Office, where engineering excellence is where we really look into what our engineers are doing. Engineering excellence is focusing today on seven different capabilities. These are the ones that we focus on at this point in time. Of course, you need a lot of other capabilities to be able to design in the right way. Other capabilities are considered mature and not in focus for the time being. Design for cost is the newest capability that we have. It's one and a half year old within Tetra Pak. And the reason for bringing that capability into engineering excellence was that we have a lot of different focus areas where one of them is to reduce capital equipment and parts product costs, which is an, is an important area for us. So why do we say design for cost and not like many others do design to cost? Design to cost for me is when you have a, a specific target cost and you design towards the target. For me, design for cost is more a question of mindset. And I will explain further. Looking at design for cost and what we want to achieve with that, the mission is to provide tools and methodologies and knowledge to enable optimization of capital equipment and spare part costs from early design. The vision is that design for cost is the mindset of our, our DSO development and service operations culture, fully supported by tools and processes. The desired state is that costs 
have, along with quality, become the backbone of our design ambition. Quality has always been a given within such a pack. Nobody has ever, ever questioned that we should have the highest possible quality. And low cost is very often considered as contradictory. Tools to optimize costs are a natural part of the daily design and supply chain work. It's a question of having the tools to do the design right. And the engineers and manufacturing specialists and supplier managers are working closely together with suppliers to attain optimal cost for equipment and spare parts. It's of course a question of designing right to have the right cost, but it's also a question of making sure that we pay the right price. So both of those requires that we have knowledge both from the engineering side as well as from the supply chain side. So do we actually know what our part should cost? Do we have the competence to evaluate the should cost? We did a test. We sent out several parts to several designers. Uh, this is just one uh, example. The designers were given the task to estimate the cost on this particular part. Just this example is quite a simple bushing and we asked them to estimate the cost of this one. And the answer we got varied between 8 euros and 150 euros. Quite a big difference. The competence of understanding the manufacturing process and estimating costs related to that, something that we have lost due to that we have outsourced our production of equipment since more than 20 years. So the people with the actual experience from production has left the company. Uh, they have retired most. The younger generation of designers are very well educated, but have quite low experience from practical work. So how do we bring that competence back? That was the question we asked. And that is actually how a priori came into our life. We started a project with the objective to evaluate different tools. We didn't have, we did have manufacturing specialists, but we had too few of them. It's a competence that is not really easy to get. They became the bottleneck. So the business objective was to reduce the number of cost reduction activities by enabling identification of cost drivers early in the, the design cycle and enable design for cost to optimize cost of drawn parts. And of course also to aid supplier negotiations by making cost estimates uniform and provide a cost breakdown report on part level. So what, what are the benefits by using a priori or any tool, but in this case a priori? The major benefits are early cost visibility and understanding versus cost target, if you have a cost target. Automatic cost driver identification, knowledge building, simple and structured reuse of cost estimates and aid cost validation in product development. During the product life cycle, when you have improvements of your existing technology, then you have a part price indication based on the market cost to understand what we actually pay. You can identify the outliers in current spend, estimating cost of engineering change order, simple supplier uh, comparison, and the batch size optimization, of course, aid supplier negotiations, and we could have, which we don't have today, yet specific supplier VPs. The major benefit, as I see it, is really the cost awareness and understanding of what drives cost. For the engineer, I see the delta between the existing and the new design as the major benefit to focus on, not the absolute figures. Then, of course, it's a different question when we talk about supply chain and, and actually what we do pay, and because then we need to understand the real should cost. But for the designer, the delta is the most important. The, process that, the processes that we use today in our a priori is sheet metal, bar and tube, stock machining, and welding assemblies. Those are the ones that represent the highest part of, of our machines uh, and where we really can see the big use of the tool. Then we are entering into casting, to model machining as well, and we might in the future also uh, add plastic molding. But I don't think that we will add mechanical assembly because we don't really see the benefits with that. But we have, though, with the four production processes that we're using today, we have spent spent and are still spending a lot of effort in validating the process groups, adjust them to our reality, because for us it's really important that we have a good accuracy to build the confidence in the tool. It's really important for our designers that they can trust the results that they get to be able to evaluate already at the concept stage and to, to really choose between different concepts and different options that they do have. As I said, we have spent a lot of time in, in validating the tool and adjusting it to, to our reality. And just to, to give examples of that, we have used a priori, we have done manual costing with our experts, and we have compared to what we actually do pay today. And with the adjustments that we have done, we are in, in at least some of the, the process groups very close 
to the reality. But as you can see when you look here, we have also some outliers that we have found and where we really do have saving opportunities. Comparing a priori uh, to, to the other methods has really given us the trust and the understanding of the tool. And the flexibility of the tool to be able to tune it for, for our reality has really given us this good result. What also helps us in using the tool and adjusting it to our, our world is the possibility to create our own BP. So what we have done is that we have created our virtual production environment for Sweden, Italy and China, where we do have our major part of, of the production. And we have also built an organization to take care of and drive the continuous improvement of the tool, support the users with specialist competence, and of course, uh, update all the figures in the tool. The designer is fully accountable for the cost. We provide tools and knowledge and uh, to be able to evaluate different concepts and solutions, understand cost drivers, and to do the right choices. We expect designers to do cost estimates and the Future. In the future, we will make sure that we do have at least 95%. We are 95% accuracy when it comes to the equipment cost already quite early in, in the design process. Then, of course, we cannot expect our designers to, to cost all parts in, in the tool. We think that we will reach approximately 70% of our drawn parts that are good to cost by the designers themselves in a priori. 30% we still think that we need specialist competence to be able to cost. Still many of those will be able to be costed in a priori, but with some, some hands-on adjustment by our specialists with deeper manufacturing technology knowledge. But at least 70%, the designer themselves should be able to cost very quick and very simple during the design process. To show you an example where we have used a priori in a cost reduction activity, we use a priori to evaluate all the drawn parts in one specific machine. At the same time, we use this project to validate a priori. So we actually had both a priori and our manufacturing specialists doing the costing of all the parts. And the, the costing where a priori and the manufacturing specialists agreeing on, on the price that we consider as the market price. And as you can see from this graph, the market price, we only had one part out of 100 that were bought on the market price. We had 16% that were actually priced below the market price, what we considered the should cost. 34% of the parts were priced 25 to 100% above the market price. 26% was priced 125 to 200% above market price. And 24% were priced more than 200% above market price. With these findings, we went back to the supplier in this case and just told them that we have scrutinized those parts and there is something strange we said. Can you do something? And only by saying that, not addressing anything about how many parts and not anything about how much the difference was, only by doing that they lowered the price by 15% in average. So that was even without negotiating anything. So of course there are things we can do also on existing machine. But it's important to understand that still what we get from a priori or what we get from our specialist is still estimates. It's not fact. I think it's important to see to say that the results that we get we should be used in discussions with our suppliers and to understand the differences. There might be reasons for differences. So it's important not saying that it's a fact. But the benefits that we've seen with a priori in this case, we do understand the cost drivers in the past. And it, it might be very small changes, for example, on, on tolerances that make a big difference in cost. Cost estimate data, database enables reuse of the cost estimates. We can compare. We can go back and compare when we have done changes. We have a consistency in the cost estimation that we do, which also makes, makes it easier to discuss with the customer or with the supplier when you have differences. And used in the right way, it's a very good base for negotiation. We want, of course, to make sure that we use the tool. So we have created some KPIs. Of course, we want to reduce manufacturing costs. In this specific, specific case with the KPI, it's for spare parts. We re want to reduce the risk of projects not meeting target costs. A priori is used. We will measure that it's actually used in the organization. It's no use having a tool that is not used by people. And we will measure the number of people that we do have trained. There is a little bit of a cost saving in our KPIs, but most it's mostly focusing on actually that we use the tool and that we build the knowledge, that we build the awareness 
of the cost drivers. These are the absolute most important because if you are aware of what drives cost, if you are looking at the cost from a very early stage of, of the design, then we will not end up with a too high cost in the end and hopefully no cost reduction activity. We have a rollout plan where we will have mechanical designers and supplier managers trained and we are closing close to the end of 2016 now and we have up to today 65 trained users and we will have another 10 before the year end. So we're actually spot on uh, the plan with 75 users by the end of this year. Though most of the, the trained people are mechanical designers and the supply chain participants will come next year. So let's look at where we want to be and where we actually are. A required future state is that there is a clear understanding of roles and responsibilities in the organization organization. During cost estimation activities, mechanical designers, manufacturing specialists and supplier managers are fully aligned around the way of working. We still have some things to do there. We are starting and we are designing the, the processes, how to work with costs, but we are not fully there yet. Cost estimation is performed in a tool that uses free or CAD data as, as a basis for cost factors. Yes, of course, a priori is connected to CREO and we do have the tool for that. Mechanical designers and others have the ability to do cost estimates early in the design process. Cost estimates is based on the existing model ge geometry, tolerances, etc. Estimations can be performed instantly at any time during the design work. Yeah. We can do it. The tool is there. Even if not everyone is trained, the possibility is there. Cost reports for drawn components are available early in the design process. The report framework and content are based on supply chain operations requirements. The reports should clearly state if the prototype cost of the in industrial life uh, product cost is estimated. We are not really aligned there yet. So we have started and the design engineers are using the tool, but we are not fully taking the advantages of the tool in the supply chain yet. The tool used for cost estimation shall include and deliver necessary manufacturing knowledge to enable cost estimation. Yep, we're there. Mechanical designers are trained and have good knowledge in cost estimation. Identification of cost drivers is a natural part of the design work, not fully, but we're going there and the more users that we have trained and the more we use the tool, the more knowledge we get. All cost calculations are stored in a central database accessible by, by all stakeholders. We do have the database, but still we do have some uh, manual estimations done and they are not yet stored in, in uh, a priori, but that is the aim. Since we do not have all our organizations trained, all the stakeholders do not have the access yet to the database. There is a clear ownership of cost data in the tool database. Raw material cost, hourly rate machining, uh, a structured process is implemented for change and update of cost data. Yes, that, that, that we really are in control. Designers, manufacturing specialists uh, are able to support supply chain in cost estimation on drawn components. Cost data on drawn components is available to supply chain earlier and with a higher accuracy. Before and during negotiations, supply chains are able to get information about cost factors directly from the cost estimation. We are not fully there yet. As I said, uh, the, the aim is to go there and we're working on it. So of course, the journey of change towards design for cost has started. It's a long journey, but also a long journey starts with, with one step. And a priori is for us one of the important steps on this long journey to design for cost. Thank you all for listening. Okay, Karen, thank you so much. That was a great presentation and I liked I like the way you described it as a journey. I think that this is this is a commitment on the part of the organization and your thoughtfulness and how you designed a system and a process and teams to support it, along with the tool and the infrastructure, I think is a key success factor that we see in many of our customers for adopting product cost management is a strategic business initiative. And so again, thank you so much for sharing your, your journey and your insights with our audience today. I'll remind everyone that we have really probably one of the greatest collections and concentrations of product cost management experts in one location at one time at the Cost Insight Conference February 6th through 8th in Orlando, Florida. We currently have a number of case studies that are very similar to Tetra Pak and will share their own thoughts and journey on how they're implementing product cost management as a strategic business initiative, including companies like Honda, BRP, Bombardier Recreational Products, 
Wu Cheng, which is coming in from China, one of our really great early customers in the Chinese market, Whirlpool, Celestica, and there's a bunch of others that are already signing up. So, so I think that we, we will wrap it up there. We've held you on for a bit of time today. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. <music>